Hello and welcome to Above and Beyond Cancer's Cancer Education Series, brought to you by Mercy One and Above and Beyond Cancer. My name is Chris Goodale and I'm the Executive Director of Above and Beyond Cancer. And it is my pleasure to introduce our founder, Dr. Dick Deming, who will introduce today's speaker. Dr. Deming? Hey, thanks, Chris. Welcome, everyone. Yeah, it's my honor to introduce our speaker tonight. Uh, Sandy Seaman, and she grew up in Woodward Granger and then went to the University of Iowa, where she got a degree in biology. She then got her Doctor of Naturopathic Medicine degree in Seattle, Washington, and she's back here in Iowa, and uh, she is uh, doing naturopathic medicine at Dragonfly Healthcare. We actually spoke, uh, each spoke individually at a conference earlier this year to a group of seniors on the move, and that's where we met and kind of realized that we had a lot of common interests and a lot of uh, commonality in the holistic way of taking care of patients. She's gonna talk tonight about the immune system and its importance. And obviously everyone probably realizes the immune system is so important in much of what we do, obviously in cancer, but also in this time where we're talking about COVID and vaccines, that's all about the immune system. So without further ado, Dr. Sandy Seaman. Thanks, Sandy. Thank you. Well, that was very kind. I'm gonna put up my lecture um, here so you can see that. Um, Pull it into slideshow mode there. All right, so um, we want to talk tonight about the immune system. And as Dr. Dumming said, you know, there's a lot um, of different um, pieces and parts. You know, it's a moving, the immune system is always moving from that standpoint. So, um, you know, the first question that I always get when I put up this slide, you know, when I talk to groups um, like you all is like, what is naturopathic care? What is a naturopath? That's a whole new word for me, or that's a whole new um, concept or new idea. And naturopathic doctors um, have the same anatomy and biology and all of those training as any other doctor. Um, but in addition to understanding how to utilize medications and surgery and other approaches, naturopathic doctors spend a thousand hours additionally learning how to use nutrition, learning how to use diet and lifestyle changes and helping and motivating people and being able to spend enough time with people to really get to the bottom of what's going on with their health care, as well as working with things from nature, you know, working with diet, uh, working with nutritional deficiencies, working with herbal medicine and homeopathy. So all of these things may be new or maybe familiar to you tonight that we're talking about, but all of them are really specific towards the immune system. And um, it's my goal to really bring this as a hopeful message tonight. So I'm not going to be focusing on heroics. I'm not going to be focusing on things to try to kill things or get rid of things or eliminate things. This is really a hopeful message based on um, the function of your own immune system and how to build up your own immune system and how for your own immune system, not only to take care of things like viruses, which is kind of that V word, you know, that we're not wanting to say right now, because it's really producing and promoting a lot of stress to people. So I'm really going to minimize my use of that word just because it tends to, um, it, it tends to promote more fear in the way that it's been utilized. Uh, so from that standpoint, um, I want to begin to talk about the immune system and we can't really talk about the immune system in our body or can't really, you know, begin, you know, any talk about the body really without understanding and speaking to and about the microbiome, which is this collection of trillions of different bacteria, um, viruses, which are beneficial for us. So there's 30,000 different types of beneficial viruses as well as yeasts and um, other microbes that make up the terrain of our immune system that's present within our digestive system. And this is a part of our immune system that's protective. This is a part of our immune system that helps to crowd out unhealthy organisms, things that shouldn't be within our body or things that shouldn't have a space or a place within our body. So they benefit us just by taking up seats 
so to speak, if, the, if we think of the microbiome like a stadium, we think that they inhabit or take up these seats so that we can't let in things that we know the names of or that we have you know, concerns about from taking up those seats. So part of what they do is just take up space and produce a competition there. Um, the other thing that these beneficial organisms do for us is that they help us digest our food. They also um, help us by making vitamins in our body, particularly like vitamin K is a vitamin that is um, really important for um, the manufacture of blood and also the ba balance of blood within our body for clotting. So incredibly important uh, for us, particularly when we're thinking about inflammation and we're thinking about clotting as being a piece or part of the concern about this oxidation status when we're um, thinking, moving forward about how our immune system is working. Um, these um, organisms within our microbiome are also do about one fourth of our detoxification for us. So we have really become, you know, the more that we understand about the microbiome, and as time goes on, I think the more we'll learn about the microbiome, that we are really interdependent, you know, upon this. And there's a lot of things that we do, um, you know, sometimes even. Um, things that we don't realize that we do that could be disrupting the microbiome. I mean, we're, most of us are aware of the influence of, you know, antibiotics, for instance, but sometimes the foods that we eat or even the water that we drink can have an imbalancing effect on the microbiome, such that I like to liken the microbiome to my clients as our digestive pets. So you think of what you eat, you know, but you also think of what they eat um, from that standpoint. So in taking care of our microbiome, some of our diet or a portion of our diet really has to be thinking of how do we take care of our microbiome. That'll be a piece or a part when we talk about diet um, tonight as well. So our diet and our lifestyle, particularly our medications and also stress is another thing that influences these organisms. So not only do we have to you know, think about and protect all of these things for ourselves, but also for this other piece or part of our immune system that happens to share um, our body as well. So when we talk about the what's called the innate immune system, I like to think of this as the neighborhood watch, the part of our immune system that is always looking out um, for us, looking out for trouble, looking out for imbalances, not only within the microbiome, but also throughout the rest of the body. Things that could get in, say, through our nose, through our throat, through our skin, particularly broken skin, you know, as well as through our digestive system. So this um, part of our immune system includes many cells, but I want to touch on two cells. And um, one of them is, you know, fairly easy to understand what it is that they do just from their name. They're called natural killer cells. So you can think of them as the part of the neighborhood watch that you know, really um, eliminates threats, you know, that really does a very good job at, um, you know, eliminating what shouldn't be there, taking out um, things that would keep us from being safe, things that would keep um, our, you know, secondary immune system very, very busy. But if we take care of it before it even enters the body or before our secondary immune system has to deal with it, we can allow that secondary immune system called the acquired immune system to rest. So it's incredibly important for those natural killer cells to be as healthy as possible, to be as active as possible, and for us to have adequate amounts of it. And when we talk about nutrition, when we talk about different nutrients, I wanna talk particularly about the, that part um, of the immune system because this is the part of our immune system that really is out there protecting us, is really out on the streets, you know, is really watching out for us. Um, the secondary um, cell in the um, innate immune system are called macrophages. And uh, macro just means big and phage means eat in Latin. So they're big eaters, you know, so most of us can uh, have some level of understanding based on the last seven months, what they do, <laughs> myself included. So these big eaters do a really good job of eliminating threats, particularly by eating them or eliminating from them from the system. These macrophages are also really important um, part of our immune system um, because they eliminate inflammation. They reduce inflammation. They heal and repair um, the body as well. So this is also 
a secondary part of our immune system in that it's continuing to make sure and mop up inflammation within the body. I think of this as kind of the cleanup crew is the other part of our um, innate immune system. So keeping these cells happy is also really important because I, I think of it just like when we when we leave a room, we want to turn the lights off. And inflammation is the same way that we don't want to leave inflammation partway done because that's when we see more and more issues happen in the body is when inflammation doesn't get shut off at the end of whether it's an injury, whether it's an infection, you know, whether it's some kind of disruption, disruption to the body. When we don't clean that up all the way is when unfortunately inflammation, um, low level inflammation tends to persist within the body. So the purpose of this innate immune system is both to seek and destroy as well as to clean up, you know, kind of to keep everything neat and tidy um, within our bodies as well. So when we think about the acquired immune system, that's kind of our secondary immune system that we use when something evades or you know, overwhelms that primary innate immune system. And this requires several different cells that can be activated, um, you know, and that's activated through a group of chemicals you know, that, that these different cells produce in order to talk to one another. So um, neutrophils or other white blood cells get activated from chemical messages that get sent throughout the body. And that is really what produces that inflammatory mechanism that again, we wanna make sure that cells like the macrophages turn off at the end of these. Um, the antibodies themselves that we've heard a lot about, um, um, particularly now that we're talking about things like vaccines, it's really important for us to recognize that it's a secondary part of our immune system that can take between 10 to 14 days to produce these antibodies. And that's the big concern about why we want the innate immune system to be active all the time and to be very protective of us is that sometimes it can take, you know, quite a bit of time comparatively for those B cells um, to, you know, basically they're dissecting, they're, uh, you know, understanding the threat, you know, within the body once it's gotten past that primary immune system. And then they have to design um, a mechanism through antibodies that, you know, are produced and distributed throughout the body in order to um, destroy a threat um, as well. So that's the the backtrack a little bit with um, those B cells is that it can take a little bit of time. And also why we want to, you know, after we receive a vaccine, whether it's the flu vaccine or this vaccine that they're upcoming, that we want to be really protective of ourselves. And we're going to talk about some diet and lifestyle changes that will allow these B cells and this acquired immune system to be acting at its best. Because if we're going to go through, you know, these, um, these vaccines, we want them to be working, you know, and we want our immune system to have an adequate response to it. And then we also want that immune system, again, to calm down, you know, afterwards. So we want that to be a regulated immune system. I think that's the biggest concern that we've seen, you know, in the last six to seven months is seeing that um, all pieces and parts of our immune system really need to work together. So it doesn't become that kind of runaway train that we've seen where issues have happened as well. So when we talk about a diet for the healthy immune system, we have to talk about things to keep off of your plate. And then we have to really talk from my standpoint about what you want to put on your plate. Cause it's sometimes we get really overwhelmed and really caught up in the things to eliminate. But if we don't complete that conversation by saying, this is what I think a healthy plate looks like. Sometimes it's easy to get overwhelmed and kind of get some analysis paralysis with that. And that we don't get it to, um, we don't get a positive message for it. So it's important for me to have some straight talk, you know, about things like sugar, for instance, um, and its impact on the immune system. So it's not a new research study, but it's a really helpful research study for us to understand the impact of sugar and particularly how sugar can stack up, you know, along the day for us to, for us to create issues. So it's, you know, the biggest issue is when we continue to, you know, throughout the day to really design our meals around sugar and sugar being the main component of our meals, because we can see that the immune system is suppressed 
by 50% for five hours is really kind of a, a basic statistic that you can see there about sugar. And that is a pretty decent amount of sugar um, is what was used in this research study, 100 grams. So it's a lot of sugar, you know, but that is also one thing to keep in mind. You know, it sounds like a lot, but 100 grams of sugar is not one of those things that's very difficult to get, particularly um, when you stack it up um, you know, with multiple things within your meal adding up to to be a little bit more sugar. And this would include simple sugars um, as well as juices. You know, that's one thing I think that's been a big misunderstanding, you know, about, for instance, vitamin C, you know, and us focusing on orange juice as a source of vitamin C. There can be a number of teaspoons, um, actually, of sugar within that um, juice, you know, that you're drinking in order to get your vitamin C. And these immune cells that we were talking about, you know, for the immune system actually have receptors on them. They have receptors for sugar, which is how we get that suppression of the immune system that's lasting. And that sugar binds with that receptor, kind of like a lock and a key that they fit together. And that um, receptor can downregulate those cells, kind of like telling them to go on break is what's happening. Um, vitamin C um, is one of those things that can activate these cells. But if these cells get two mixed messages or if one out overrides the other, um, for instance, if there's a lot more sugar than vitamin C in that juice, then we're going to get a overall suppressive effect that that um, cell is going to go on break rather than getting activated because it's overwhelmed by the amount of sugar that's in the juice versus, you know, the amount of vitamin C that's in there. So instead um, of focusing on juices or simple, um, more simple sugars, we want to eat a rainbow of fruits and vegetables, including the fiber, because we know that fiber is that food for the digestive pets. Fiber is the food for the microbiome. That's what feeds the microbiome and that's kind of what keeps them around, you know, in our digestive system. It's kind of what keeps them in the seats, if you want to think of it from that way, from that stadium analogy that we talked about before. So fiber um, has a beneficial effect for our microbiome and it helps it to work better as well as helps those beneficial cells to be able to multiply and helps more of our immune system to be weighted. You know, if we think of it like a scale, it helps more of it to be weighted towards the beneficial part of our immune system. Um, Inflammation is a big term that's been talked about all over the place um, right now when we think about the immune system. You know, we've already talked about sugar and its effect on suppressing the immune system. It also is one of the things that promotes inflammation within the body, which as I said, inflammation is one of those things that can tie up the immune system in a phase of repair rather than actually the immune system being ready for and adequately um, available to, um, to be ready for a threat, you know, to, to um, adequately um, eliminate threats. We also know that um, our fats within our diet are also really important for inflammation. So many of us are aware of omega-3s, for instance, which we think of as being in things like flax or chia seeds um, or maybe salmon or other fish. Um, we also know that grass-fed um, land animals like beef, for instance, are also um, higher in omega-3s as well. Um, what we want to avoid are more of the grain-fed um, animals. And that could be chicken, that could be eggs, that could be beef, you know, that could be other sources as well. What those have, instead of having healthy omega-3s, they have omega-6s. So while we may look at the price, you know, of grass-fed beef versus kind of the basic beef there and see that there's quite a distinct difference in price, what you're paying for is essentially the same supplement that not all of us want to buy in a pill and swallow. What you don't see, you know, in, you know, on that little card, you know, when you're buying your meat or on the package of your meat is really what you're buying is a less inflammatory product. And what these tend to also be is, is much more satisfying, much more nutrient dense is the other part that you're getting when you're getting in, um, 
your um, meats from animals that were grass fed, that there's going to be much more nutrition in there too. So you're often satisfied with a smaller portion as opposed to um, kind of that standard, um, you know, meats that we're getting that could be higher and higher um, amounts that we need to eat to really feel satisfied as well. And then trans fats, um, those hydrogenated fats um, that we're seeing thankfully less and less of within our food system are also uh, pro-inflammatory for our bodies as well. Um, other foods that we would want to you know, limit our amounts of, particularly if we're feeling a little bit more excess mucus, if we're um, feeling like maybe you were a little bit more run down um, would be foods that actually produce more mucus in the body. So if you know that that's part of your issue that you tend to get more phlegmy, you know, um, easily, foods that produce more mucus in the body would be dairy foods. Um, so milk and cheese, for instance, and then wheat-based foods like pasta or breads, you know, would be other foods that um, but we would want to reduce, particularly when we're feeling a little bit more like we're well, a little bit more phlegmy. Maybe we have um, <clears throat> a little bit in our throat or maybe we're um, having, to, having a little bit more of a runny nose. That would be a great time to kind of put these foods to the side as well. So when we look at our plate, um, what we want to do ultimately, you know, many of my clients begin, you know, us talking with you know, sometimes dividing our plate between meat and vegetables, you know, it's kind of the half and half, you know, that we talk about from that beginning. And so what we, where we begin is by carving out a little bit more space, a little bit more room on your plate for vegetables. You know, sometimes where we begin is just with one serving or a fourth of our plate, you know, becoming um, a vegetable, a space or a place for vegetables and that crowding out or kind of reducing the space for others. We don't want to just keep piling more onto our plate. We actually want to carve out and reduce, you know, some of the other portions, particularly of things that don't make us feel satisfied, don't make us feel, um, you know, energized, you know, after we eat things that make us feel a little cold or things that make us feel a little tired would be things that we would be reducing um, the amounts of on our plate. So once we've carved out space for one serving of vegetables, sometimes then we work up to maybe a third, you know, of your plate as vegetables, maybe equally divided, you know, amongst your vegetables, your protein, um, you know, maybe there's a whole grain on there or a potato on your plate. Um, Maybe there's a little space on your plate for a fruit or something sweet um, at the end of your meal so that you feel a little satisfied um, at the end of your meal as well. And then eventually what we want to work up to is about half your plate um, being fruit and vegetable. Um, having a quarter of your plate being reserved for that potato or grain and then um, a quarter of your plate being reserved for your protein. And sometimes that has to do with that switch that I talked about of a protein that's a little bit more nutrient dense. So you get more satisfaction. Um, you know, we talk in my client in with my clients a lot about that signal from your stomach to your brain. So we're not trying to do this with willpower. We're not trying to do this with our, the magic of thoughts. We're actually doing this by working with putting things on the plate that send a signal from your stomach to your brain that tells you that you're full and that tells you that you're satisfied. So a healthy diet doesn't come with willpower. A healthy diet comes by balancing, you know, these signals from the body and how the body communicates. Um, and that is also um, a healthy diet for the immune system. So when we talk about nutrition and we talk about nutrients um, for the immune system, the first one that we want to talk about is vitamin D. You know, and many of us know this now as the sunshine vitamin. You know, what we know of is that we're heading into a season where we're, go we're going to be getting less and less exposure to the sun or less and less exposure of our skin to the sun, particularly. And right now, the parts of our skin that would get exposed to the sun are parts that we're washing very frequently, for instance, our hands, you know, and um, you know, many of us are also being very cognizant about not touching our face or, you know, really keeping our face really clean um, as well. 
And the precursor to vitamin D is actually present as a portion or a part of what is on our skin already. So as diligent as we're being about washing our hands and keeping our body clean right now, it can actually be a hindrance um, in some ways to that fat layer that is present on the surface of the skin that actually is what produces vitamin C in within the kidneys and within the liver of the body. So while we're doing a wonderful thing to protect one another and you know to, to keep you know all of these um, pieces and parts of different organisms from getting into our system, we're not always doing big favors to ourselves for the production of vitamin D. So many of my clients are having to supplement even with additional vitamin D um, in order to be sure that their immune system is protected. And you know, much of the research right now is really surrounding prevention for vitamin D. What we're seeing is you know, much higher levels of people who get hospitalized with some of these immune system issues um, is happening in people who have lower levels of vitamin D. So that's one thing that you would be really important you know, for you to get your levels checked. Um, you can do this um, through your doctor. You can do this through a kit that you order at home. You know, there are many different options and opportunities. And right now, as we're just shifting, you know, from a season where maybe we've spent, you know, a good portion of time outside to looking at heading into a season where we don't spend as much time outside, we've really maximized right now the amount of that vitamin D that we are going to get from the sun. So this would be a great time to kind of see your vitamin D at its peak level um, that you're getting from the sun. And it'd be very important for you either to supplement if you weren't making up for um, you know, some of that because you know, we're being so diligent about keeping our skin clean right now. Um, or it'd be really important that you supplement it in order to maintain that healthy level that you have, that you may not be getting within the next um, you know, season to come based on our exposure to the sun as well. Um, so vitamin D is one of those that does store in the body, but it's really important for us right now to not be relying upon that storage. It'd be really important to be maintaining or add, even adding to that storage, given that we're heading into a season where our immune system is challenged a little bit more as well. Um, vitamin A is another fat soluble vitamin. It's another one that we store in our body as well. Um, so I've got some foods listed here, all of these orange foods, um, you know, as well as the leafy greens that you're going to see leafy greens kind of showing up on almost all of these um, lists, which is why doctors like myself are continually trying to carve out space on your plate for more and more of those green leafy vegetables because they are so nutrient dense. They have, they cover so many different categories of nutrients that it's it's really important um, you know, for us to kind of make the most of every bite of food right now. So um, vitamin A we know is working not only with strengthening the mucous membranes and you know, as many of us are aware right now, it's our mucous membranes that are really most um, influential with eliminating you know, or preventing um, you know, some of these organisms from getting into our body as well as that's right where that um, innate immune system, that first part of our immune system, the, the, the neighborhood watch part of our immune system is present on those mucous membranes. So keeping those healthy, and I always use that analogy of a, of a puppy, you know, you want them to have a wet nose and our mucous membranes should be the same. So hydration you know and nutrition like vitamin a is particularly important at maintaining the integrity of those mucous membranes we don't want them to get too dry and we also want them to be full of nutrition you know that keeps that immune system healthy vitamin a also works on that secondary part of our immune system so these foods um, or including vitamin A as a supplement you know whether it's through multivitamin or whether it is also um, important through, um, through uh, extra supplementation would also be really important as well. 
And there can be some genetic variations with some of these nutrients as well. Um, vitamin A is one of those that some people are very good at taking foods like sweet potatoes, spinach, uh, you know, collard greens and carrots and making them into the activated form, um, which requires two molecules of that beta carotene within the body to make vitamin A. And some people um, like myself are actually a little bit less likely to do that. So I'm one of those um, folks that actually make sure that I supplement with extra vitamin A, particularly when um, I feel that my immune system has been um, you know, under a little bit of attack like we're finding right now. So that's one thing that I will add kind of extra, even sometimes above and beyond my multivitamin if I feel that that's really important as well. Um, vitamin E would be another one. You know, we think of vitamin E as, you know, having skin, you know, benefits is probably the most, you know, or scar, you know, benefits is probably where most people are familiar with vitamin E. But what we know of is that when we increase our levels of vitamin E, that we reduce you know, or prevent you know, any invaders within the body. So it's also present as an antioxidant within the body. So antioxidants, you know, we know are really very important for helping to shut off that inflammatory process within the body. So um, not only in and of itself, you know, is it prevention, um, but it also helps with that cleanup process within the body. It enhances both that patrol, you know, our neighborhood watch part of our immune system, as well as the secondary, um, you know, acquired part of our immune system. And then even in and of itself, vitamin E can have some effect at eliminating anything that's invading the body as well. So um, nuts and seeds like almonds and sunflower seeds are great places to get and sources of vitamin E. Again, greens would be another one that I would put um, on this list um, as another source of vitamin E. And then supplementation, looking for a multivitamin that at least gives you that recommended daily allowance you know, of that um, in the body as well. And vitamin E is another one that, that gives us a little bit of leeway because it's also a fat soluble vitamin. So it's not one that you necessarily have to include within your diet every day, but it's really important for it to be around, especially during times of increased need, um, you know, and noting and noticing that the body can readily, you know, utilize vitamin E during a threat or during a potential concern as well. So vitamin C is probably the one that you all thought of first, you know, when we were going to be talking about nutrients for a healthy immune system. So we know that not only does vitamin C increase the production or increase that um, millions and millions, you know, of cells within the body that can be created within a very short amount of time when necessary, when the body feels threatened, it can very quickly mobilize um, an internal army in order to eliminate, you know, any potential threats. What we know of also, um, you know, it being Veterans Day, I'm going to be using a whole lot of uh, army <laughs> analogies here. Not only is it about increasing the production of these numbers of white blood cells, but it also helps them to be able to move throughout the body, you know, particularly because we know that while our mucous membranes to us are on, um, are close to the surface. They're also kind of the farthest away if you think of the body as well. And if you think of, you know, your mucous membranes are actually theoretically outside the body, which is why some people who are brave take that neti pot and actually can pour water through their sinuses. And the whole time it's still outside the body. So what we have to recognize is even what we think of as on the surface, if we're thinking of our immune system that needs to migrate to our mucous membranes, it has a little bit, a little ways to go. And we want that, um, all of those cells to be very mobile. And that's one thing that vitamin C is very, very good at doing. It increases those antibodies. So this is one thing particularly to supplement with during times of increased need or during that kind of window period when we're really trying to get our immune system to produce antibodies. And then it's also great at producing an immune response. Um, so citrus, you know, fruits are probably, you know, one of the um, 
you know, again, the things that come to mind from that, but red peppers, um, broccoli also is actually a really excellent source of vitamin C. So again, I have to keep throwing in, you know, anything that's green and leafy, you know, as another source um, of vitamin C. So when we look for vitamin C supplements, it's very common to find out there these little packets that have vitamin C in there or chewable vitamin C are really common, but we have to be very mindful of the amount of sugar that is in these. It's important for my clients for me to suggest to them that we want one gram or less of sugar because most of those packets have a thousand milligrams of vitamin C in there. So if we have a thousand milligrams of vitamin C, competing as that lock and key with those receptors within the body, we at least want to have equal amounts of vitamin C compared to the sugar that's in there. Many of the, those little packets that I see out there have five grams of vitamin C or 5,000 milligrams of um, the sugar in there compared to the 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C. So when we think of those receptors, it's going to be much easier, unfortunately, for the sugar to downregulate the immune system as that vitamin C is upregulating the immune system. So, um, so twist around your bottle, you know, either of you know those little packets, and make sure that you get one that's one gram of sugar, um, or you know, watch those um, versions that are chewable. I know they're much more fun, and it's very easy to be compliant um, with those. It's very easy to get them because they taste really good. But when we're looking for that overall benefit of vitamin C, we want to make sure that it's not getting downregulated actually for our immune system. We want to make sure that it's actually having the benefit um, that we're looking for. So vitamin C is a water soluble vitamin, which means that it's present within the body for a very short amount of time. The body utilizes what it can and the rest of it comes out the next time that you use the restroom. Um, so that's one thing to be cognizant of with vitamin C as well, that I typically talk to my clients about taking it, you know, either with each meal or several times throughout the day um, in order to make sure that we're getting that continued res beneficial response for the immune system, particularly during a time maybe when somebody is really trying to produce those antibodies or when somebody is feeling a little bit more run down or going through a little bit more stress. It's something to be really mindful of as well. Um, so zinc is another, you know, piece or part of our immune system. That's one that, um, you know, many of us are familiar with potentially because one of those big symptoms that we're looking for right now with these, um, you know, out there is a loss of taste and smell. And that actually is paramount um, to a loss of zinc because we know that zinc, like many other nutrients, has multiple effects within the body, that it binds to a protein and helps to have the effect of giving us our taste and smell. But if the immune system needs it, the body is going to be diverting that to the immune system rather than you know, another effect within the body. So for finding there's not enough to go around, our immune system is going to get first dibs, unfortunately. Um, um, compared to, you know, making our food taste and smell delicious, you know, as well. So it's really important for, um, for us to be mindful and aware, even kind of testing ourselves a little bit to make sure that right now that we're not um, utilizing all of our zinc, you know, in another way. We know that zinc is not only important for the immune system in that it has a direct role in destroying viruses, um, but it's also, zinc is also really important for um, division, cell division. So that's another thing that in that, in producing, you know, that increased army or that increased um, patrol, you know, throughout our body, that zinc can be utilized that way as well. So particularly when we're feeling a little bit more rundown or when we're feeling like we have an immune system challenge, zinc is really important to be sure that we're utilizing in adequate amounts. Um, so we know that pumpkin seeds, peas, um, those green leafy vegetables again, um, and then animal-based proteins like lamb or venison, you know, not typically the ones maybe that are on our plate are great sources of zinc. And many times that has to do with the diet um, because zinc is one thing that's going to come through more green foods. 
is where it's going to be accumulated, you know, in the animal that then we harvest to eat. Um, supplementation is another great way to get zinc and zinc is one of those unique nutrients in that our taste for it, if it isn't overridden, you know, in like the zinc lozenge, for instance, by a tremendous amount of sugar, um, zinc is one of those things that many times I will teach or show my clients to utilize a zinc lozenge as a way to test the immune system. If um, zinc, a zinc lozenge to us has very little taste, if we, if we don't have, um, we don't have really much taste with it at all, it's one of those signals to the body that we actually need more. And as we start to flood the immune system, as well as the, you know, DNA division part of zinc, and we begin to regain our sense of taste and smell and really begin to get more acute sense of taste and smell, our body will give us that message of, oh wow, we will begin to get a pretty strong taste and smell of zinc. It can actually be a little metallic to some people or unpalatable to some people. So it's interesting when people first start taking um, a zinc lozenge, particularly when they're deficient, that they will go through, you know, several you know of them and not have that taste and then you know a couple days later my clients will will call or text me back and say you know oh goodness these zinc lozenges taste taste bad you know and i'll say then we're on the right track we've done the right thing you know we've we've replenished your zinc um, amounts within your body so when we talk about stress um, in the immune system, we know that the level of immune system suppression that we have, again, because of these receptors that are present on these immune cells to um, the same hormones that our body produces when we're under stress. The, probably the one that we're most familiar with is called cortisol. So we know that um, cortisol is produced when the body believes that we're under threat or under attack. You know often from something outside, you know, the body, some sort of stress or, um, you know, um, of, um, for sure. And what we know of is how we cope with the stress is really what's most important. We know that the immune system functions at its optimal level. It functions at its best when we were at rest and when we were at peace. And for some people that can particularly be particularly difficult to find. So, we have to look at what I call life rafts, you know, different ways, whether that's coming from a spiritual standpoint, whether that's coming from your own reassurance or asking for, you know, your friends or family or partners reassurance um, in order to recognize that you're safe, to recognize that you can be at peace and relaxed. Sometimes for my clients, I actually give them cards to write out cards to themselves, you know, mantras or meditations or things to remember for themselves to help to put them at a state of safety, of rest and peace. We know that we can only maintain that level of what we call a fight or a flight mode where we're under tremendous amounts of stress for a short amount of time. And typically rather than actually coming to a space or a place of peace or rest or joy, I know as Dr. Deming calls it, um, is another um, level that many times we go into a state of kind of being shut down or kind of a state of numbness. And it's not uncommon for us to utilize sometimes foods, um, sometimes, you know, things like television, for instance, are ways that we kind of shut off or shut down. And, you know, many of us have, you know, gone through minutes or days or hours, you know, right now of kind of shutting down because it's just too much or it's too overwhelming to deal with the stress that you're dealing with at that time. And this isn't to overwhelm anybody. It's just to recognize that there's a vast difference between spending a day at rest or spending a day at peace, which sometimes requires a whole different activity than maybe, you know, watching television or something that doesn't really reset us or rejuvenate us. So I talk a lot in my clinic between the difference, the difference between shutting down and feeling safe and relaxed, you know, and we really, you know, talk about and make a list of those life rafts for each person, things to do or things to say to themselves or that somebody can actually reflect um, or say to them that help them to get into a state 
of joy, is a state of rest and a state of peace. And we, you know, look at how we can include those things on a regular basis, not only for our daily outlook and our stress outlook, but the effect on the immune system, because it's when we're under that tremendous amount of stress and that part, that innate part of our immune system, that patrol is being put up, you know, in a state of um, dormancy that it's really important because we're losing that opportunity to be fighting invaders at that time and they're being overwhelmed and overridden by our stress. So it's very important to, to recognize that not only can nutrition play a big part, but our outlook, our mental outlook, as well as our emotional way that we take care of ourselves is really important, as well as sleep, of course, is really when the immune system is functioning at its highest level. Um, and hopefully it's at a time when our stress is at our lowest level, you know, what we know of about all that nutrition that we just talked about is not only is it important for the immune system, but it is also all of the same nutrition can get diverted to the production of all these stress hormones. So while we may be taking or eating the right foods and, you know, taking the right supplements or eating the right foods, what we can recognize is that we want these foods to be fueling the immune system on the state of rest. It's not just what we eat, but it's the state of mind and state of being that we eat them in, in order to make sure that we're not just fueling more stress, you know, within the body as well. And particularly at times of stress, when there's things that we're coping with or things that we're struggling with, and we know that we are producing higher levels of those stress glands, we need to, again, optimize and even supplement with additional nutrition for the immune system that goes above and beyond that as well. So when we talk about supplements for the immune system, it's really important to check with somebody that's familiar, you know, with what medications it is that you're taking, which, what different treatments that you're doing in order to be sure that, you know, things aren't interfering or things aren't increasing or reducing your levels. Um, you know, there definitely is such a thing, you know, as, um, medication and supplement interactions and interference, even foods can have an interference, you know, with different levels of supplements and different, different levels of medications and we, the ways that these things are processed through the liver and through the detoxification system. So it's really important to make sure that before adding a lot of these things, you check with somebody to know that you're doing the right thing, that you're not interfering with something else. And I would definitely say that these supplements are not free of side effects or these supplements are not free of concerns as well. That's another um, big myth about herbs and herbal medicine is that they're always safe and always, um, you know, easy on the body, which is not always uh, true. So um, one of the biggest things we've talked about is protecting those mucous membranes and the fact that we're putting a mask, you know, many times over our face and our nose. There's the production of you know, and when we're talking, you know, often with those on, we are introducing bacteria from our mouth within our, into our nose. And that's just not um, something that over the long term or over tremendous amounts of time that is healthy for us. Because these two different um, portions of the microbiome should always be separate and should be protected and should be different. So what we want to do is make sure that we are protecting those mucous membranes and balancing those mucous membranes. So propolis is actually a really sticky extract of, um, a, it's a bee product. So um, I utilize it quite a bit, not only because I talk for a living, um, as you can see, but I also protect my throat because we know that that's one of the ways in which we see these invaders get into the body is through the throat and through the nose and mucous membranes. So protecting our throat and same thing with um, utilizing a nasal wash or a nasal spray, something that just simply washes clean, um, whether it's, you know, because we've been exposed to something or whether it's because we've been wearing that mask for a tremendous amount of time that we want to just wash, wash away, wash clean anything that was introduced from the mouth to the nose or nose to the mouth, um, because we certainly know that we're mixing both of those microbiomes, you know, through the use of a mask right now, but, and also just, just protecting and maintaining the health, you know, and the integrity, making sure that our 
um, nasal passages and our throat don't get too dry, um, as well as that they that we're protecting them from that um, bacteria, you know, or other invaders that could be in there as well. So what we know of about zinc, which we talked about earlier, is that we would combine it with other foods or food extracts that it actually increases the absorption rates and increases the penetration. So it's not just for zinc about whether it's floating around in the bloodstream, it's whether it can get from the blood into the tissues and particularly into the cells, whether it's within the mucous membranes or around the mucous membranes, like the nose and the mouth, or whether it's throughout the digestive system, you know, perhaps where something that has been swallowed or been introduced into the system as well. So it's very important um, right now when we really want zinc to be working at its highest level to combine it with um, an apple or onion extract called quercetin. So that word may be unfamiliar to you, but just know that it is actually a food extract. And quercetin is a great addition right now with your zinc um, and you can supplement it alone um, or you can get a supplement of quercetin that also includes extra vitamin C. Um, quercetin also works as an antioxidant within the body. So it also has that same effect like the vitamin E or the vitamin C that we talked about at actually calming down um, parts of our immune system that can become overactive or become overactivated throughout this inflammatory process. Quercetin is really good at calming down a group of cells called mast cells. And those are the cells that produce histamine. So if you're familiar with histamine because you're a person who's had allergies or you know all of those symptoms of histamine where things get itchy, things like your nose and eyes can get really weepy, quercetin is also really good at managing and maintaining um, the stability of those mast cells, which is what gathers a whole bunch of immune cells and sometimes Again, that immune you know, response doesn't get calmed back down. So quercetin does a really good job, not of suppressing the immune system, but modulating or balancing the immune system. And that's really a, a big fancy word you know, that we use in naturopathic medicine to say it doesn't stimulate, it doesn't suppress, but it balances you know, within the body. So it doesn't let the immune system response get too high and it doesn't let the immune response get too low. It keeps it right in the middle in that healthy level, which is where we want it to um, work. So that's um, you know, one kind of benefit you know, by combining that zinc with quercetin, not only is the absorption, but that quercetin has all of these other side benefits within the body as well. So broccoli sprouts is another food that we've heard, you know, such immune benefits, detoxification benefits, inflammatory benefits within the body, but also it can help with nutrient absorption for things like zinc as well. And then green tea, whether you just include that um, as your drink, you know, because most of the time when we're taking our supplements, we need to be taking it with a drink anyway. Um, so whether we include that green tea is just what we take our supplements with, or whether green tea kind of becomes our warm drink of choice, you know, which many of us are switching, you know, kind of from a cold drink to a warm drink right now. Um, green tea has additional antiviral benefits in and of itself. So again, we're getting, you know, even more benefits, you know, than just helping us absorb that zinc as well. So when we talk about herbs, there's a couple different herbs that I want to touch on. And, um, you know, these are ones that have actually research um, for concerns that we're facing right now with um, invaders within our system. So licorice has some properties to prevent um, the invasion of viruses, you know, within our body. There's actually some particular research at, at this um, SARS cove, you know, as well, which is great to see. Um, it's, you know, nice that we actually have something from a natural standpoint that we could utilize if somebody is either not able to get to or not um, available, you know, to have another um, approach for this. Licorice is one of those herbs that we want to watch in somebody that already has blood pressure issues. So it wouldn't be um, an appropriate use for somebody that has blood pressure concerns because it has the potential um, to increase levels of potassium within the body, which can raise the blood pressure. So um, calendula is another herb or marigold is another um, is a common name for calendula. So 
who knew that marigolds were that healthy for us, but that supports the integrity of our nose and throat, um, which is very important. So it also has some direct antimicrobial effects too. So other benefits for us. Um, calendula can be added to teas, you know, so it'd be another way to stay hydrated. Um, it'd be um, another herb that you could utilize, you know, on an ongoing basis just for support um, as well. And then elderberry is another herb that we know of is, that's modulating to the immune system and modulating to the inflammation within the system. It's particularly good at enhancing the immunity um, and it can help actually reduce the days um, of the flu. So the way that we know that that must be working is actually by stimulating that secondary immune system to be more effective, to be more efficient at producing those antibodies so it can reduce the number of days that we're struggling with, um, with the flu, for instance, um, by a number of days. So it can reduce it, you know, by an average of two days, you know, which is great because, you know, the more time that that, that buys us, the less time that we spend in inflammation and the, the, the less of that um, inflammatory response that the body needs to maintain and balance. Elderberry is another one that's commonly present in a syrup, and I do a lot of advocating for my clients to make it themselves or to find a lower sugar um, response. Again, just because we know that a little bit of sugar goes a long way, and the elderberry syrups that taste the best are often the ones that have added sugar that can have that backtrack for the immune system. Um, I love to utilize elderberry in a lozenge for my clients, not only because it's a lower sugar um, option, but also because it dissolves slower within the system, you know, and gives much more protection where exactly where we need it, where we know that those invaders are getting into the body right through the throat um, as well. So I just wanna share kind of my recipe for an immune build, building, and this could be a soup or this could be a salad, depending on you know, your preference or depending on how you wanna do it, including huge amounts, you know, as much as you can do or as much as you and your partner can stand smelling it on one another or your family of uh, garlic and onions, um, including those colorful vegetables that we know would be, you know, you can be thinking right now when, it, you know, when she names off those greens, you know, she's thinking, vitamin A, vitamin E, vitamin, you know, um, zinc, you know, some of those extra nutrients that we're getting in there, some vitamin C in there. So adding in some broccoli, some peppers, some carrots, maybe some celery in there for some additional fiber that you're getting, taking care of your microbiome while you're at it, getting a nutrient dense protein, whether that's coming in the source of chickpeas, whether that's coming as, um, a farm raised chicken, something that you know is going to have those healthy amounts of fats in there, as well as some of that immune boosting benefits, and then is really dense in healthy fats, as well as being dense in um, you know nutrients, you know, in there particularly those minerals, which we know of are what gives us you know when we have the flu. That's really where those aches and pains are caused from, is diverting of that nutrition you know, from, you know, like calcium and magnesium to the immune system rather than from our muscles. So that's really where we get those symptoms, you know, that achiness um, that we get when we're struggling with an invader. Um, if it's a salad, you can add some nuts or seeds, or you could even put that on top, you know, if you do a pureed soup um, as well. So nuts or seeds, again, would be giving us more of that vitamin E, you know, more of those extra nutrients too. Um, I love to include mushrooms in my cooking, whether it's um, canned mushrooms, whether it's dried mushrooms, whether it's, you know, mushrooms that, you know, right now come in a lot of teas, you know, would be another way to balance your immune system. Or this could be something that you saute, you know, and put um, either onto your salad or um, into your soup as well. Um, including a mineral rich broth, whether that's coming from vegetables, whether that's coming as a bone broth, you know, something that you home make is also a great way to utilize all those scraps, you know, from your vegetables that you're cutting up and putting into a, a compost or putting them somewhere that they're not getting used. Um, or, you know, from an animal source that you're utilizing that utilizing the whole animals, it's really, you know, a helpful way to make sure that you get the most of those minerals out of there. Um, a super salad is going to boost hydration. 
which is going to protect your mucous membranes, you know, as well as inflammation is washed away when we're continually hydrated. We know that that inflammatory part of our immune system is calmed down simply um, by being more hydrated. We know that we're less reactive when we're more hydrated. So multiple reasons right now, and especially where we're going into a season where we're less likely to drink, but it, we're just as dehydrated because we're doing a lot of things that we're, are um, taking of our water, you know, as well. So adding in immune system herbs, whether it's a curry soup that you use, you know, something with turmeric, whether you're including um, like a Chinese five spice that would include an anise or licorice flavor, whether you're including herbs that balance the immune system, such as astragalus, um, whether you're including herbs that come more from, you know, a Mediterranean tradition like oregano and thyme you know, or something from an Asian tradition like ginger, all of these different cultures include these herbs, um, you know, not only for flavor, which again is that signal from the stomach, you know, and the tongue to the brain that tells you that you're satisfied or tells you that a meal is actually really satisfying to us, which is why restaurant foods taste better to us is because they include actually more flavors. They hit more of that flavor profile on your tongue. Um, and they know how at restaurants to build flavors, which is why we miss them so much. Um, but the same thing can be replicated at home with different spice combinations that come from different traditions. There's one called Chinese five spice or curry is actually a spice blend or India has blends called tandoori masala or garam masala, which aren't spicy. Um, they still work with my Iowa palate. You know, they add a lot of flavor, but they don't add a lot of spice. So you're not going to get a lot of stars on your meal, but you're definitely going to get a lot of flavors with that. So the benefit that we get in all these herbs is not only the flavor, but it's also the fact that it, all of them speak directly to our inflammatory system as well as to our immune system. So you can include these into your broths or you can include these into a salad dressing it would be another great way to introduce it as well. So I'm super open to any questions that anyone has. Um, you know, I just, you know, can't touch on mindset without talking about, you know, that this has been, you know, for many of you, I know, you know, a particularly rough, you know, moment or a rough time, but I have, you know, 2020 is about clear vision, you know, and we, it was never going to be, you know, <laughs> what we expected it to be. We've had to look for, we've had to develop clarity, you know, a vision to look for, for these silver linings, to look for what has been beautiful or what has been, you know, gratitude inducing, you know, this year. We didn't think, you know, that we were going to develop clear vision without having to work for it or that's 2020, you know, which a lot of people have equated to a year of vision or a visionary year um, without a little um, hardship, unfortunately. So um, my heart goes out to all of you that are going through hardship. And I know that it is a cultivated attitude to look for silver linings um, and to look for the messages within um, the struggles, you know, that it is that we're going through. So I just wanted to um, let you all know how important it is that um, to cultivate, you know, an attitude where we look for th these things and we look with our, our hearts and we look with our kind eyes, you know, for clear vision. Sandy, this is Dick. I just wanted to thank you for a wonderful talk. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, I bet you are a fabulous cook. I think it would be fun to just uh, prepare a meal that's not only fabulous tasting, but also where you get the satisfaction of knowing that you're, um, you're participating in boosting your immune system and in, and in finding joy. So um, as you know, I'm a big fan of the belief that adversity leads to personal growth. So boy, I think we're all growing a whole lot this year. Definitely. And, you know, uh, Chris, are there any questions in the um, chat box? I know we're we're a little over time. No, I don't see any questions in the in the question and answer or in the chat box. Well, one thing that I that I wanted to share, you know, particularly with you, Dr. Dunning, but also with your whole audience that knows you and your desire to cultivate joy. One of my clients calls it vitamin J. And so I just wanted to share that with you, that that's another vitamin that is so important to include in your diet or to include in your mindset, you know, every day. So 
we talk about that each time that he comes is what is your vitamin J for this, uh, for this time. So that plants a seed for you, but it's not mine. I can't, we can't take any credit, but uh, feel free to use it as your own too. And then all of you out there as well. (laughs) Well, great. With that, I want everyone to seek joy and then spread joy. So that's, that's your assignment till next week. Thanks, Sandy. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Sandy. Remember that this will also be recorded. It has been recorded tonight, and it will be on our YouTube channel. So we appreciate your really great insight and very helpful hints and, and uh, direction for our good health.